a KQED HD production. As Associate Curator of Entomology at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, Brian Fisher has millions of the world's insects at his fingertips. And for him, that's still not enough. Since 1992, he's made annual treks to Madagascar, a large island off the east coast of Africa, to collect as many species of ants as possible in the country's last remaining virgin forests. So I started working in Madagascar, one, because it's a highly threatened environment. About 90% of the natural habitat of Madagascar has already been destroyed. But 10% is left. And that 10% harbors a highly unique fauna, highly unique insect. In fact, 99% of the ants found in Madagascar are only found there. So we went there trying to do an inventory of all the ants and other insects. But to my surprise, the first years we began discovering a high number of new species. In fact, now we've discovered over a thousand new species of ants. Sure, lots of people consider them pests, best squashed or wiped out with insecticides. But did you ever wonder what the world would be like without the lowly ant? To have the ecosystem function, we need the insects. I say ants are the glue that holds a forest together. Ants are important for recycling soil. Ants are also like the vacuum cleaner. They find every little dying insect, and they clean it up and eat it and recycle that nutrients. In other words, ants are important in the brown cycle. That's right, the brown cycle. The process by which organic matter decomposes and nutrients are cycled back into the ecosystem. Imagine a city without garbage collectors. Likewise, without these tiny sanitation engineers, most terrestrial habitats would shrivel and die. So it's a very good thing there are so many of them. We share the planet with an estimated 30,000 different species of ants. Ants are clearly successful. They dominate in terms of like biomass. In fact, if you put all ants together on Earth into a big pile, they'd weigh about as much as all humans together. I mean, they're out there. And like humans, when ants move into a new environment, they are capable of shaping and changing it to their liking. But there is one species of ant in California that has taken this ability a bit too far. In the Bay Area, homes and the environment is basically plagued by this invasive ant called the Argentine ant. Sadly, the native ants can't really compete against it. And with the arrival of the Argentine ant, we've watched time and time again the displacement of whole areas of native ants. And this impacts not just other ants, but other organisms. We all know this ant. It storms into our pantries, our yards, and our pet food bowls. In fact, if you see an ant on the sidewalk in Northern California, it's almost certainly an Argentine ant. Neil Sitsui studies the social behavior of ants and bees as an evolutionary biologist at the University of California, Berkeley. He spent the last 15 years trying to uncover the secrets of the Argentine ant's success. Here in California, Argentine ants range from um, about an hour north of San Francisco all the way down to the Mexican border and beyond. And they occur uh, very abundantly in coastal areas in the Central Valley um, and at very high densities in these parts of their introduced range. This innocent-looking little ant is believed to have arrived from South America to New Orleans in coffee shipments in the 1890s. A few years later, it reached California. And in the century since, it's eliminated virtually all the native ant species in its introduced range. I mean, one of the best illustrations of the impact of Argentine ants on many different members of an ecosystem is uh, the coastal horned lizard in Southern California. It turns out that the coastal horn lizard eats only a few native species of ants. And so Argentine ants invade, the food of the lizard disappears, and so the lizards in turn disappear. In order to figure out how to control this insidious invader, Sitsui focused his research on the ants' unusually hospitable behavior toward Argentine ants from neighboring colonies. 
Most species of ants form colonies that are spatially restricted and they fight with other colonies of different species, but especially against other colonies of the same species. And so they're what's called multicolonial. But Argentine ants here in California are very different and very unusual for ants in that they form what are called super colonies. So you may have many different nests where Argentine ants live, but they're all cooperative with each other. They don't fight with each other, and not only that, they'll exchange food and they'll exchange members. And as a consequence, Argentine ants achieve incredibly high population densities. But why are the invasive Argentine ants so friendly to Argentine ants from neighboring colonies? It turns out they're all wearing a similar uniform. In ants and other social insects, they use these waxy chemicals on their exoskeleton as signals for who's a member of their colony, who's not. They essentially have labels on their bodies that can be smelled and that can be used to identify the colony identity that each worker comes from. Sitsui and his team were able to identify the specific chemicals that Argentine ants use to signal to each other that they're kin. They found that by changing an Argentine ant's external chemical uniform, they can turn a formally friendly relative into a potentially threatening intruder who is quickly drawn and quartered by the other members of the colony. Sitsui hopes to use this discovery to develop non-toxic insecticides that will convince members of the same colony to attack each other. Ultimately, what we would like to do is develop a way to turn the Argentine ants against themselves. Where we could selectively target Argentine ants and hopefully leave everybody else in the ecosystem unharmed. While Sitsui works to control the intruders, Brian Fisher seeks out the last remaining populations of native ants in the Bay Area. This is a great habitat. Here we are on the coastal bluffs, a little secret refuge for the native ants of San Francisco. And uh, we're just gonna pull over some stones and look for ants. Try these stones here. Oh my gosh, we got something here. This is actually the ant I was looking for. It's kind of nice to know at least there are still these endemic species with us in San Francisco. But Fisher is quick to point out finding these native ants is only part of the job. The information is useless if you can't catalog it and make it available to others. And that's just what Fisher aims to do with AntWeb, which he designed to help bring taxonomy into the 21st century. Most people have never heard of taxonomy. They have no idea what it is. In brief, it's the people that go out, find new species, describe them, and give them a name. So taxonomists need to get their information out. And with AntWeb, we basically are digitizing everything we know about ants. And in addition to that knowledge, we're adding beautiful images of each of those species. Hey, Aaron, it's your lucky day. We've got some local ants to image right from the Presidio. When an ant specimen arrives in Fisher's lab, it's carefully labeled and photographed. Then its profile is uploaded to AntWeb for all to see. Currently, there are 4,600 species imaged on AntWeb. Check out the hairdo on this ant. But let's check out the ants we collected. Here it is. Formica subpolita. On the right, we have a map. We can zoom in and actually see that we were collecting it just near Golden Gate Park in the Presidio in the coastal prairie. And over here, we have the three standard views and an image of the label. We can quickly load up the ant, and there it is, our beautiful Formica subpolita. AntWeb is a great example. Now, anybody, anywhere, at any time, can become a taxonomist. You don't have to be based at a museum. We've discovered but 10% of the living things on Earth. 90% is out there to be found. We need more taxonomists. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem that people are beating down the doors to higher learning institutions to become taxonomists. So Fisher has recruited some pint-sized partners to help with his research. So where do ants live? You gotta think like an ant. So if you were an ant, where would you hide here? <gasps> where? In the dirt? Like In the over dirt? there? There's no way I alone could go and visit everybody's backyard, every corner, every county, and find out what's out there. We created the Bay Area Ant Survey. Anybody can go out and collect ants and submit it to the California Academy of Sciences 
we've already gotten 800 submissions from the local community. And that data shows up instantly on AntWeb. There, wait, I found an ant, look! Where are I... We didn't even know in San Francisco where we could find native ants until we launched the Bay Area Ant Survey. We were surprised that there are still tiny pockets of native ants amongst the sea of invasive ants. We ask these simple questions. What living things exist? Where do they live? How are they related? Simple questions, but we've got very few answers. As a taxonomist, I want to discover new species, but I also want to share that with others, and I want that data used in conservation.